Hey, welcome to SI Now. It's Friday, June 30th. I'm Priya Desai, and I'm pleased to be joined by world champion competitive eater Joey Jaws Chestnut. All right, it's almost 4th of July. What says 4th of July better than competitive eating and hot dogs? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing on earth. Well, fireworks are a close second. Fair. And, and beer. But uh, no, this, this, is, uh, this is part of Americana now. Uh, the hot dog contest is huge, and, and it's uh, every, every, every 4th of July, uh, high noon. People are looking to watch it. Well, we have two volunteers that are going to do their best with what we have to offer here. We have Steve and intern Frank. Do you have any tips going in? Just uh, get into a rhythm. Do the same thing over and over again. Uh, you have two minutes to eat it. You know you, you, know you have a, a capacity of at least 10 hot dogs. Just try, try, try to get it in within two minutes. Oh. Three, two, one, eat. Oh, yeah. We, he, there you go, we're both going meats first, dunking, dunking the bun. The dunking bun helps help get the food down. <laughs> yeah. He's looking off into the distance like, like, he, like he's thinking. Yeah. You, you gotta focus on the food. You gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta focus on the task at hand. Push it. Get your hot dog done. It's not gonna eat itself. All right. He's, a, he's got one down, he's working on the meats. 90 seconds, guys. 90 seconds. Keep going, focus. You can do it. Put the meat in your mouth and swallow it. <laughs> Come on. Mm. Uh. You gotta get that bun really wet. It's not gonna be able to go down if you don't get it wet. I mean, Joey, how much of this is in your head? A, a, a lot of it's just convincing your body it's okay to eat this fast. If, if, if uh, you've never done it before, it's like your body is rejecting going this quickly because you're going, you're eating in front of people, and it, it, it's, it's weird. But it, you just gotta you understand this is it's competition. It's not eating for pleasure. Well, it's Sunday night dinner at my house, but we have less than one minute left, guys. Right. Dude, you're falling behind. He's 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 ahead. He's finishing up his, his... Oh. You got this. You're gonna let the intern win? He's a warrior today. 30 seconds. Get that bun wet and do his stuff. Just start it on the next one. Don't be scared. Come on. EMT on site. Come You're on eating for, for your family. <laughs> your ancestors. Your past, present, and future. 15 seconds. Come on, get started on it. 10. Take nine, a little, take some eight, of that bun. Take some of seven, that bun. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, time. Mm. Down. <laughs> Who's the winner? Our intern did two and a half against two. A solid two. <sighs> Sorry, Steve. Frank. Frank. Intern Frank, congr congratulations. <laughs> Great job, buddy. <laughs> hey, shout out my dad. Shout out MG. Shout out all them single ladies. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and the boys. And the boys. Really cutting up. You know who had a weird, uneven go of it this NBA season? The league itself. To quote Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You had a super team roll to the title, dominating the season the way red dominates the color of stop signs depriving the public of anything resembling drama. For the third straight year, this unstoppable juggernaut faced the same team in the final. And the losers were left parting ways with their GM and actively trying to upgrade the roster. If this is how the second best team in the league acts, what hope is there for anyone else? And yet, it didn't much matter. The week after the finals, we were captivated by the NBA draft. The week after the draft, we had an MVP announcement. July will bring talk of free agency. Gordon Hayward's movements, Blake Griffin's GPS coordinates will suddenly generate more curiosity than any story in baseball. The NBA has become a 12-month sport. Unlike the NFL, it also has become remarkably free of critics. The actual basketball, often that's the least of it. We talk about rings atop cupcakes, crazy Uncle Phil, JaVale versus Shaq, and yes, the dad whose name we dare not speak. In the end, the NBA reminds us that sports are played by athletes, but also by humans. Risk angering some customers by sponsoring a float at a gay pride parade? Too bad, says the NBA, we're allowed to take stands. But here's the thing, the league that seems least like a business 
might be running the best business of them all. That's the ironic part. Or then again, maybe not so ironic at all. For the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad brag. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. That is Lou Gehrig's famous retirement speech given at Yankee Stadium on July 4th, 1939. Just over two years later, Lou Gehrig would have passed away, having succumbed to the devastating disease ALS. Richard Sandemir has written about the Iron Horse and how Gehrig's legacy was impacted by a movie made about his life called The Pride of the Yankees. The book also has that name, The Pride of the Yankees, Lou Gehrig, Gary Cooper, and the making of a classic. Okay, Richard, Gehrig was larger than life. His baseball resume was unmatched. Six World Series titles. He was a two-time MVP. He was a Triple Crown winner. How did a movie make him even bigger? Well, remember, his personality was not outsized. He, lived, he, he played in the shadow of Babe Ruth. He was a very quiet guy. He was very modest. He was the very opposite of Babe Ruth. And so, so the movie took that legacy and added to it a, a, a reenactment of the luckiest man speech, and that has perpetuated the, the imagery. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there a modern day example of an athlete who has their life turned into a movie and it makes them even bigger than they were? I mean, I think of Rocky, I guess, but... But Rocky know, was fictional. Was based well, off of Chuck Wepner, but you know, not a real person. No, no. It, I think what Pride of the Yankees did was showed how almost there's almost been nobody like this. You see movies about fictional people, uh, whether it's uh, uh, in Million Dollar Baby or Bull Durham or all those people, all those movies created something much bigger than the fictional characters themselves. But for, 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 for Gehrig, a modest guy about whom a movie probably would not have been made if not for the fact that he died tragically. This, for 75 years, this movie has almost carried the torch. Uh, you can't look at the life of Gehrig without understanding the pride of the Yankees has helped add to it and perpetuate it. For instance, that clip you showed of the speech, very little of that speech is left from the newsreels. That's why when people think of the speech, they're largely thinking of Gary Cooper delivering the speech. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I like I write in the book, we're not even really sure who came up with the luckiest man idea. Was it Lou? Was it his wife? There's a lot of well, the, mystery still to uncover. Different stories about yeah. how, who wrote it? Did they write it together? Did they, he didn't go out there with a piece of paper. There's no, there's no text, but Lou Gehrig walked out there nervous as he was, his body getting depleted by, by this. Standing in the heat of July 4, 39, between games of a doubleheader, he can barely lift the gifts that he's getting, and he delivers that speech. The exact script, we don't know, but he delivered a speech that people remember forever, in part because Gary Cooper delivered it. Yeah. And the luckiest man line was the second line in that speech, in the real speech. It was the final line in the in the movie. In the movie. Um, you covered sports media and sports business, sports really, for the New York Times for over 25 years. Now you've moved on to obituaries. Yep. Um, but one of the last big media stories that you broke was Bill Simmons being fired from ESPN. I'd love you to assess now sort of how do you think Simmons is doing with his new venture, The Ringer, and whether or not you think he has any regrets about how things went down with ESPN? Well, I think his voice needs to be heard for his ventures to work. And Grantland had some great writers. They wrote long form. But ultimately, ESPN didn't think that worked out very well. So they closed that after he left. And he's got a voice of a generation. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. I don't know if he has regrets because now he gets to call his shots for the most part. In the end, he didn't seem to like having the shots called for him or being told what to do. Uh, I like his writing. I want to see, I want to see his writing more. If the, ring is to, if the ringer is to succeed, I think he needs that voice out there. Let's talk about ESPN. Obviously, the layoffs of a lot mm -hmm. of on-air talent got yeah. a ton of attention. Diagnose the health of ESPN right now. I still think it's mostly healthy, but it's got to watch itself in, very, in ways that it never did before. They're losing subscribers. 
all cable networks are losing subscribers, but when you're charging cable operators and cable subscribers so much money, if you're losing 10 or 12 million over a few years, you have got to find some ways to save money. Part of it is, 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 is laying off people, but when they have, when their deals, when their sports rights deals come due, I don't think you're gonna see them owning everything that they own right now. Richard, it's great to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. As we hit free agency this weekend, I don't want to hear any hand-wringing about super teams. Oh no, what are we going to do? All-stars getting together? Great players wanting to win a title? How dare they? Super team is not a dirty word. They're not ruining the NBA. They're the best thing the NBA has going right now. Don't break them up. I say bring on more super teams. Bringing the best people together to achieve excellence has a pretty good track record. Ever see the movie Ocean's Eleven? I watch it like twice a week. Or in music. Like when Pearl Jam and Soundgarden joined forces for Temple of the Dog. Or when Kanye and Jay-Z got together for Watch the Throne. And who doesn't love the Avengers? So what's the problem with doing the same thing in the NBA? Postseason ratings were up with the Warriors and the Cavs running through each conference playoff. There was so much buzz around the finals, we haven't had that in decades. Fans are drawn to excellence. That's why you're watching me right now, right? Okay, bad example. Parody might be great in the NFL, it doesn't work in the NBA. I want to see teams pull out all the stops to win a title. That might mean signing free agents, or that might mean losing. I'll take the process over being perpetually stuck as the number six seed any day. Rockets making a great start by trading for Chris Paul. Now if you can add a third with James Harden, we're talking super team. The Celtics could be patient and wait for LeBron to get old, but I'm a fan. We're not patient. I want to see them add Gordon Hayward and Paul George right now and go for it. How great would those Eastern Conference Finals be? between a fully stocked Celtics and the Cavs. Now, I know a lot of teams are left out, but they can start playing their own super teams. The ingredients are simple. Just collect a series of great draft picks, have a really smart coach, and a GM who's brilliant at manipulating the cap. Mix them all together, and boom, you have a super team. Or just sign LeBron James. Those are really the two best ways to form a super team. Now, there are a few teams that have the beginning pieces of a super team. The T-Wolves could be on their way if the Jimmy Butler trade pays off, the Sixers have the all-potential super team with Fultz, Embiid, and Simmons. And the Bucks have a 22-year-old Greek freak. Stars are going to want to play with him. I know this is all fantasy right now, but start thinking super team as early as possible. If you want to remain competitive, make the playoffs every year and never even sniff a title, go ahead. Spend a lot of money on a guy like Joe Johnson and have him be your number one guy. And don't complain to me if you lose in the first round. I'd rather watch the Warriors beat up on everyone for 82 games and watch a matchup between the Hawks and the Pacers or the Jazz or the Hornets or any team in the NBA's great middle. Come on, let's shoot for the stars. And to all you haters out there, to be great is to be misunderstood. So bring on the super teams. Bundesliga champion, World Cup champion, Jerome Boateng, thank you for being here. You're on sort of a, a mini tour of the United States, New York, Miami, Las Vegas, maybe California. What do you like to do when you walk down the street in New York City? Well, I would say after the World Cup 2014, it changed a little bit. Then some, some people recognize me, but it's not crazy like the NBA players or I don't know, some stars here in the US. So that's why I also like to be here because I have a little bit more time for my own. You were the first soccer star to sign with Rock Nation, with Jay-Z's company. Did you do that because you are a fan of Jay-Z? Well, of course, also this is a, like, it was an honor. I was totally shocked when I heard this. And of course, when I grew up as a kid, I listened to his music and everything, and then to meet him was, yeah, like a dream come true. We saw that Real Madrid just won back-to-back -back Champions League titles. Is this version of Real Madrid perhaps the greatest team of all time? Well, it looks like at the moment, like you can't say anything else. They won um, two times in a row the Champions League, and you saw this now in the final. They won 4-1 against the Italian team, which is... Um, normally really strong defense, then they score four goals. So People are looking at the Golden State Warriors now and wondering, can they ever be beat? You know, because of the team they have assembled. Do people feel that way about Real Madrid? Mm, I think, well, of course now they're in the position, everybody wants to go there and be there on the top. 
but um, it changes quick. You had this before with Barcelona. Um, they had um, if, like a couple of years where they were on top. Now Madrid is on top. This can change um, next season. Of course, other teams want to change that. Our, my team or different teams, there are a lot of good teams in Europe. So we will see this for next season. One question about Bayern Munich losing two long tenured players with Lahm and Alonso. What does that mean for your role on the team? Well, first of all, we we losing two legends, one like Philip in Germany, like um, I think one of the best players ever in Germany. Like I never saw someone who play nearly every game on a really high level. And then Alonso um, from the Spanish side, he's also a legend. He won a lot of trophies. He was like a midfield leader and we could learn a lot from him. And for myself, yeah, of course, uh, I think we put this on different shoulders. Um, I include myself, I think Neuer, Müller um, also, that we um, take care of the team. We speak to the young players and we try to, to guide the team. That was, of course, in first place with Philip as a captain and Alonso as an experienced player before. Jerome Boateng, thank you so much for being here. It's really been a pleasure to no meet problem. you. Thank you. Thank you for me too. It's time for SI Now's Weekend Drive presented by Toyota. Let's go places. First, we head to London and the All England Club. The qualifying rounds for Wimbledon are underway. Two-time Wimbledon champion Rafael Nadal may be the best in the world on clay courts, but it's been nearly two years since he has competed on the grass. I hope that they serve me also to compete a little bit. I've played for years without playing many matches in the grass, and in the last two years I didn't have to pass. The last time Nadal played in Wimbledon was back in 2015, where he was eliminated in the second round. Next, we'll head down under to Australia for boxing. Manny Pacquiao defends his WBO World Welterweight title against Jeff Horn. The Aussie native is also a school teacher, which was very apparent during the pre-fight press conference. Yes, I did notice Manny Pacquiao on his phone once again. He got called out for it at one stage with, with my promoter, Dean, and he was a bit like, oh, 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 But I don't know what he's doing on it, whether he's writing notes, but he should have a notepad. But, um, you know, I tell the kids at school, get off your phone when I'm talking, so he should do the same, I guess. Horn brings a 16-0 record against the future Hall of Famer with his last two matches being decided by TKO. Lastly, we end in Russia for the Confederations Cup. This is the first time in their history that Chile has qualified for the tournament, and they have already stunned Portugal to earn a spot in the final. Here's midfielder Arturo Vidal on how the team feels heading into the championship. Con esta camiseta todos los jugadores dejamos la vida, así que muy feliz en el camarín. Había mucha alegría porque siempre hemos confiado que podemos ser campeones y ya estamos en la final. With a win, Chile would become the sixth South American team to win the tournament, joining Brazil and Argentina. And that's what's in store for this weekend.